Welcome to Beyond Ocean in Maine, MCM's news magazine program. I'm Robert Goitas. And I'm Will Mickelson. The Marshfield Education Foundation was created to raise money for grants that would benefit Marshfield's teachers that provide innovation in their classrooms. The foundation's leaders discuss with us how it operates and how it contri and contributes to Marshfield's education. So the Marshfield Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization who supports innovation and creativity in the classrooms. We provide critical seed funding for programs that the educators and teachers of the Marshfield Public School District create. They envision these, these programs um, and initiatives that they want to bring into the classroom, so they apply for grant money through the MEF. The Education Foundation was founded in 2010 by a, a number of parents of, school, of, of students within the Marshfield Public School District. Um, the parents came together and formed the foundation um, to, to be able to support programs in the school district that otherwise would not be funded by the traditional school budget. So these are the programs that are more innovative, more creative, offer additional ways of learning for students um, that support the curriculum but wouldn't be funded through the traditional school budget. So there is a grant cycle process. Every fall the grant committee puts out um, an updated rubric and expectations for um, teachers to apply for grants. Teachers have some forms that they fill out on how their teaching and learning is innovative, how it is something, you know, sort of new in a practice, doesn't matter how big or small, how it's connected to their um, the curriculum frameworks and the standards, um, you know, to help make sure that they're aligned to what's happening here. Uh, the grant committee um, reviews the grants and we use the rubric and we look at um, the grants, how much money. We um, sit as the grant committee, we talk about the grants and we talk about what is innovative, excellent and what's going to benefit our students. Grants are only funded for two years, which is something important to know because we look at with the way that the district budget cycle falls, that if the first year of a grant is something that is innovative, excellent and something that I want to pursue, they can apply for the grant for a second year, which allows the district to anticipate how to continue funding that grant moving forward. The criteria is presented every year to the teachers at and the educators at each school. So the grant committee, I believe it's in around the January timeframe, goes out to all of the schools within the, in the district and has meetings at all of the schools and invites any of the um, school administrators, the educators, the support staff um, within those schools to attend these meetings and to hear about the grant program. Within that meeting, uh, the, the MEF committee members outline exactly what that criteria is. There's a form that educators need to use to apply, so they have to be answering certain questions that we supply to them, and then that application has to be brought to the principal and signed by the teacher or teachers that are applying for the grant and also approved by the principal saying the principal approves of this program, um, they think it's going to enhance the school and that they would support um, receiving funding for it. One of my favorites was actually a postcard letter writing um, grant that uh, one of the schools was engaging with the senior center to start correspondence back and forth. So that grant was under $200, but the connection to the community, the support to the senior center, it was just a really cool thing. I think there have been innovative grants such as Snowshoes, where the PE teachers at Furnace Brook were looking to find ways that they could keep students active and learning new ways to be active even in all different types of weather. Some of the largest milestones that the Marshall Education Foundation has achieved, um, namely being in the 2022-2023 grant cycle, year is when we exceeded uh, one million dollars in um, funding for for grants and i think another monumental milestone was this past grant cycle when we hit over 200 grants funded so in in total we've 
um, provided over 1.1 million in grant funding and have funded over 200 grants. So the MEF raises grant money through a number of ways. Funding comes in through um, through the general public, um, we, um, we raise funds through donations to the MEF from community members, from family members who have students in the school district. We, we raise money and donations from alumni who have graduated from the Marshfield School District. Uh, we have corporate sponsors, um, which are many small businesses throughout the Marshfield community. And we also have a number of annual events in which our primary um, drivers of funding for the grants um, are top three events currently are our annual fall giving campaign, our annual Marshfield St. Patrick's Day 5K, and MEF supporting and sponsoring and hosting um, Circus Marcus during the summer. I am really pleased with what we get back from our community. I know the educators and the principals are so excited by what MEF is able to do. Um, I think the community feedback is great when they hear that, wow, my student was playing a ukulele in their music class, or you know, my student was doing yoga and all of those yoga mats were, don't, you know, were through a grant process for different ways to be active. Just to see the outpouring of people people that come um, to the events that we hold it is I think a testament to how much the community supports us and believes in the work that we're doing. I've heard kids talk about the VR headsets at Governor Winslow School or the calm corners that have been brought into classrooms to support um, social and emotional learning, those types of things. Um, and, and some of these in our, are in the elementary schools and these students may or may not understand who or what MEF is, but it's really fun and rewarding to hear um, kids of that age talk about these programs um, and even recognize that they're engaging with these things is, is really cool. Over the years, the McCory family has hosted four foreign exchange students at their home here in Marshfield through the AFS program. Both Mr. and Mrs. McCory discussed with us the unique experience in hosting these students. The AFS Intercultural Program is an international youth organization that helps enable people to act as responsible global citizens working for peace and understanding in a diverse world. They fulfill their mission by providing exchange opportunities for students throughout the world. One such opportunity was found right here in Marshfield by four separate exchange students who chose to live with the McCory family. I think it was about 2005. One of my daughters, my, the oldest of three, came home and asked at the dinner table, Mom, can we take a student with AFS? But at the time I had three teenagers. And so the answer was no. And then she came back about a month later and said, Mom, can we take a student with AFS? My daughter was the person that wanted to, was excited to do it, and so we thought it would be a good opportunity to, to try it and bring a new person into our family. So we did, and we did, we gave it a try. We had a family meeting and agreed to, for, to a fourth teenager in our home. Okay, um, our first student was Claire. She was from Belgium, and like I said, she was our first student that we had. So it was a lot of cultural learning and having a new person in a house other than our own three children. She practiced her religion in the same way that we did, and we felt as though at least she'd be going in the same circles as the rest of us. Our second student, my youngest daughter, was very interested in hosting, and we, she wanted to take a student from a very different culture, and so we brought Epec from Turkey. You know, the same thing as a different culture, different, you know, getting to know somebody different, and trying to you know, assimilate our best into our family and what they were doing. And you know that was right after 9-11. And um, Turkey is a very secular country, but they identify as Muslim. And I would say EPEC of all of our students probably struggled the most, but learned the most. And our family struggled the most and learned the most. When I reflect on EPEC, I think of this little 16 year old in those days, um, everybody, all of our exchange students are really interested in American presidents. And I could never understand, like, why do you care? I don't know who your president is. And I never will forget that day, EPEC looked at me and said, 
Do you understand when George Bush comes to your to my country, Turkey does what George Bush says? I had no idea. And I've shared that story with more people in the Marshfield community than I can count. This little 16-year-old brought this insight into my home over the dinner table. Our third student we took after um, my daughter went to Italy and she lived in the south of Italy for a year and came home and said, can we do it again? My youngest daughter at the time had just come back from Italy and she wanted to host again and we were kind of hesitant about doing it. <laughs> and so uh, we brought Dory from Hungary to our family. She was a great kid, you know, did everything involved with the community. I mean, that's always good about all the kids. They always got involved with the community and what was going on. Just as I reflect on Dory, I'll never forget the, the day we went to Fenway Park. It was Father's Day. It was the day after the hockey team won the Stanley Cup. Dory knew every word, every song at Fenway Park and sang like an American teenager. That singing just melted my heart. <laughs> knowing where she came from. And then our fourth students, uh, a few years later, we were empty nesters. Someone had said to me, uh, you know what, there's a whole group of young ladies whose parents would really love to have their daughters placed with an empty nester couple that really is still longing to love a, a child. So we took Aisha from Pakistan. She just got off the plane. Hi, dad. Hi, mom. How are you? Um, it was immediate, it didn't take her months to do that. She was a great kid. She was very involved with the community in, this, in the Marshfield and got herself totally involved with everything. And she, we had great experience with her. We did a lot of you know, activities with them, which we did with all the kids. She immediately became engaged at the library in North Marshfield. And un unbeknownst to me was the year that the middle school was reading the Malala book. And as it turned out, Aisha went to the English classes at the middle school and spoke to every English class that she could and teaching those students about the country of Pakistan. Um, it was an amazing year. Aisha finished her year. She tried everything she could try and um, still looks about a year as just a lifetime in a year. And I think one of the interesting stories that I do have is we had Dory, she came back for our uh, wedding of uh, one of our children so she came in to the to the to, we picked her up from the airport and she said and we kind of talked to her about because it's been a couple of years since she'd been here she says i just feel like i'm home again claire who was our belgium she came back and visited one time and stayed with us and, and she came right into the house knew where everything was did everything that she wanted to do it was like she likes it like she never left <laughs> so it's like it sounds like very memorable experiences for that i know for example that dory uh, who got married last fall, one of the teachers in Marshfield visited Dory while she was on vacation last summer. So Dory has been gone more than 10 years and that connection still remains. Um, Claire still remains in contact with some of the kids from the drama club. Hosting, it just opened my eyes to a new culture, a new understanding you know, of people around the world. I guess I never really had that experience before. They would always tell me about their country and so things you know, I never thought about before as far as somebody from another, another part of the, the world. Some students struggle, you know, i.e. Peck was our student who had to work the most. Being here after 9-11, um, there were some powerful discussions that went on in history class. And I, mostly the history teachers have given me tremendous feedback about having a student from a, a foreign country in their classrooms. The gift that these students have brought to my family um, my daughters are completely open-minded and have embraced the world and world cultures. I continue to volunteer because I want this gift for that next family in Marshfield. And uh, I can see the impact these students are having um, within the world. And again, I find myself in this room going, I can't even believe I'm here. But that was one of the gifts that these students bring. You do things that you just never imagine you'd be doing. Ann Gillespie won the Marshfield Citizen of the Year Award for her commitment to teaching pickleball to Marshfield's residents. Ann sat down with MCM to talk about what it's like to win the award and her contributions to the community. So I would say about eight years ago, when I was still working, 
Um, my husband and I took uh, the recreation department pickleball lessons and we started out in the Coast Guard Hill parking lot trying to figure out what this pickleball thing was. And we played there. It wasn't great there because the balls would be going into the forest and all. And then we would, um, we graduated to play at the high school at night and we learned under Ned Bangs and we uh, really loved the game. And it was great for stress and getting off, you know, an hour commute from Boston. It would be great to hit that ball and, and um, help with uh, my energy and health. Pickleball is set up so it's easy and it's not expensive. But, you know, there's different rules you got to know. And now, because it's expanding to all ages, um, to know the rules and the strategies. Right around COVID, I sold my business in Boston. And I was planning on volunteering in the community in Marshville. And of course, COVID hit. So you were really limited on what you could do. I was still playing pickleball, but we couldn't play at the high school. So I had been introduced to the Boys and Girls Club in Marshfield and Jim Bunnell um, was very open to new ideas. So he and Mark Free said, all right, it's adults, not children, but you could play here a couple nights a week inside. We had one court, it was petitioned off. We had to wear masks. Um, but we got out and we got exercise and we saw other people. And that just grew from there to three nights, to more nights. And then I started teaching people, volunteering. And I think that that was my therapeutic recreation background uh, way back, that I'm still teaching people um, how to have fun. And it's just grown from there. I teach a lot at the Senior Center. We actually have some more teaching coming up in um, August and it will be September. And our teaching style is all volunteers. I get other pickleball players to help. What we do is we do one teaching session and then we're on the court. And then the two days later, we get together and they learn to play, but we have volunteer mentors who um, give them feedback which, you know, you need to, there's so much to learn. So, and then you can come the next week as beginners and you can learn. And I think that system has really worked well. People have said they haven't seen anything like that way where you just are taught and then you're out there. You know, so we, we give a lot of feedback. There's been so many players that I never thought would make it in pickleball. I'm like, oh, I don't think this is going to be good for you. You're going to fall. You're going to hurt yourself. Your balance isn't good. That have gone way beyond my, you know, expectations of them. And how I've met friends. I've lived in this town 40 years, and I can't believe in my 60s that I now have a whole group of friends that we go out with. We're doing things that we weren't doing. That is probably number one that I hear from people. They thank me for helping them to make new friends. They, they like pickleball, but it's bigger than that. Mostly I'm working with the older adult at this point, like 40s, but maybe 50s, definitely 60s and above. We have 80 year olds who play. Um, I think it's gotten them out. I think it's helped them to be healthy, meet other people, so not to be isolated. I think it's helped with mental health problems in the older adult, physical, I've seen people lose weight. I don't have to go to my cardiologist. I didn't have to go on diabetic medication because I've lost weight. Um, the stories are kind of endless. I got called, I was actually teaching pickleball down at the senior center and I thought it might be an important call, so I took it. And this gentleman called me, said he was from the chamber and that I had been nominated and won for the Citizen of the Year of Marshfield. And I was like, oh, sure, this is a scam. This is what I hear about all the time, that this is a scam. The gentleman on the phone is laughing. Oh, no, this is a scam. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And he said, actually, I'd like to meet with you to interview you. And later, I did call him back. And he was luckily accepting my call and didn't say I needed to not get this award. I did, I was shocked. So it came from the pickleball community and I still can't believe, you know, that they did that. They went out of their way to nominate me. With any pickleball ambassador, I, I hear, um, there's always challenges in your community. 
on playing pickleball. There's challenges for where you can play, what's available, what could you make available, and what could work into pickleball. And then Peter Igo Park has junior tennis courts, and they were actually, you know, very accessible for us. Um, but the tennis community, if you read anything about pickleball, the tennis community in the United States is not always happy with pickleball players because they're taking their space and it's just like wildfire, everybody's playing. But um, over the years, we worked with you know the, the staff down there and, and we've been able to share the courts down there and it's just so wonderful there. So, but we use them. We've had two tournaments then to raise money for the Boys and Girls Club and Peter Igo Park over the last two years. So that was good. And then the Senior Center. The Senior Center is two pickleball only courts. Actually, in the last two years, we've had two pickleball tournaments um, and I've never done a tournament in my life or been in one. So that was on my bucket list. How do you run a tournament? So with the help of the IGO people and the Boys and Girls Club, um, we had two tournaments and they were very important to me. So they were an advanced group of players and then recreational because one of the things I wanted any of my beginners to be able to play pickleball in a tournament and they didn't have to be the best and they would just do it for fun. So we had the two groups and the first year we raised $4,000 for the Boys and Girls Club and Peter Igo. And just this last spring, we raised $4,500. We had, we've had about 70 players each time. So it, it's turned into a great event. I hope to keep doing it as long as I'm here or available. Um, and I always tell the students that I think I'm a good pickleball player, but I'm not great. And so when they surpass me on the court, not to worry. I take such joy in seeing them um, just do better in, in their health and everything else. The HeartSpeech Foundation was set up to help fundraise programs and research that focused on reducing stuttering in children. Both the founder of the organization and a speech therapist who benefited from it talked with us about the foundation's impact on the community. The Heart Speech Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, corporation. And what we do is we try to better the lives of people who stutter by getting scholarships for intensive speech therapy. It was our primary initial mission. Now we're working to uh, find ways to increase the number of people that are working as clinicians in the stuttering community as well. So nationwide, there's maybe 140 stuttering specialists. In Massachusetts, there's only about 12. So one of the things we're doing is we're working with our local universities, provide a scholarship for a second year clinician who specializes in stuttering. And we're also working now with uh, Syracuse University, uh, who's doing a, a great deal of research into um, causes of stuttering and how we can help stuttering at a very young age. As a fluency specialist, I deal exclusively with people who stutter. Um, and basically what I'm doing is I'm helping people manage those moments of stuttering. So stuttering is, a, is considered a childhood disorder, meaning that stuttering develops in young children between the ages of two and four and so forth. Some children, 80% of those children at that young age will recover naturally without any of our help. 20% continue to stutter. So we had a family member who stuttered at a, at a young age. So we had our family member in uh, different programs that made no, no difference at all in the stuttering. And when that person was 14 years old, um, we got some advice from a school clinician who said, we really can't help in the schools. You need to get an intensive program. So we found an intensive program um, and that person's had a great life because of it. But my feeling is we were fortunate. We were fortunate that we were able to fight with the schools because I'm an attorney by trade and we're able to fight with the schools to get the funding that we needed. Not everybody can do that. So one of the things I do as well is I advocate. In 2010, I met Don again, and he shared with me his idea of, of beginning a um, foundation for people who stutter so that they could access therapy. Oftentimes intensive, or most of the time, intensive therapy is not covered by insurance. So initially we started off doing scholarships and advocacy for young stutterers. 
The scholarship's to an intensive speech therapy program in Boston called Mind and Body Fluency. That's a program, it's a three-week program, very, very intense. It takes students in and works with them and basically retrains them on how to speak. And they do several things. I'll just describe briefly what they do. So initially, you go in and they'll take your speech pattern from a normal speech pattern, which would be how we speak, and they slow it down to two-second syllables. So you might say, hi, my name is... And so they go from that and they start building back up to a more normal, what we would consider normal speech um, speed. And then from that point, once they have that established, they have the students go out to the Boston Common and do surveys. They go into stores and order product. They make phone calls and do that type of thing. So at the end of three weeks, the students will actually give a speech. And many of the students that go into the program, when they start, they can't complete two sentences without stuttering. And in most cases, at the end of the program, they get up and they give like a 10 to 12 minute speech where they don't stutter once. But then other individuals will contact us as well through the website looking for funding for their therapy. And we'll, we'll meet with the um, clinicians and also get letters, um, applications from the potential students. The best part about working with Don, he's very bright, he's very motivated, he cares deeply about helping people access funding for their therapy programs. Um, he's, he's reliable, he's very creative. He's also working with pediatricians and um, trying to helping people be more aware of stuttering. It's 1% of the population, so there aren't that many stutterers out there, so to speak. Um, so he's really, I think he's got a very broad scope of what his goals are. And he's, and he's, he's, main, he's getting there. People always say that being able to go to these programs is life-changing. Oftentimes it's high school students that are going to be going to college and they're nervous about attending college because they can't speak. So when you think about, you know, our basic, how do we, we communicate, right? That's how we interface with each other. And if you can't interface by communicating, life is virtually impossible. And so for these folks to be able to go in, do a program like this, and then come out and be, you know, nobody's ever 100% fluent, but to be more fluent is really the goal. That's how I think it helps me. It helps my clients. I can't tell you how grateful they are. Intensive therapy is expensive. And so I think that, and it's also, I think, a really effective way in treating people who stutter. So it really opened the gates to a lot of people. I think over the years, about 50 of my clients received scholarship funding from the Heart Foundation. Very satisfying to know honestly that you're helping people that really need help. It's when something comes up unexpectedly. And this story involves my mother. She was down in Bridgewater and she went to a farm stand to pick up some vegetables. And the young lady behind the counter uh, was talking about her stuttering. And my mother said, oh, geez, my son has a foundation. And so she gave the young lady my name. She goes, oh my God, yes, he's the reason. That foundation is the reason I speak as well as I do right now we gave her a scholarship to go into one of the programs we support. So, so our communities that we service is the stuttering community. And some of the things that we've done, um, well, say for example, I know certain individuals that we've helped. I know that. And there's quite a few at this point after 12 years. There's well over 100 that we've given scholarships to. So I know we've helped those people. When this concludes this month's edition of Beyond Ocean in Maine. Tune in next month. I'm Robert Goitis. And I'm Will Nicholson. Thank you very much for watching.